It is time to begin. Oh yeah. Our Bible study tonight. Praise the Lord. Are you glad to be here tonight? Amen. 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 Good thing you had it. Amen. Thank God for Bible study. Amen. The Bible encourages us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's why we're here tonight, this last Bible study of the year. Praise the Lord. Amen. We, we, we've almost made it. We've almost made it. Amen. All the way by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. So tonight we're doing something a little different. We're going to do a Q&A early. We've got quite a few questions. And if it carries over into the first Tuesday of uh, the year, we'll go ahead and do that. But we're going to do question and answer tonight. Had a few questions in the box already. We're going to jump into some of these and try to catch a couple that we already had from the previous Q&A so that we can start the year uh, hopefully with a fresh deck. Right? Fresh deck. So hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's... Let's look to the Lord uh, in prayer tonight. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your throne of grace and mercy to find help in the time of need. Lord, and we look to you tonight, God, that you would bless and help us tonight as we take time to study your holy word. Amen. We ask you, Father, to minister tonight to our hearts. You know, Lord, the need tonight in this room you know the need of those watching and listening online tonight. We just pray that, God, by your word, by your Holy Spirit, that you would touch our hearts, God, and give us what we need for tonight. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Yeah. We thank you for your mercies, Lord, that are new every day. And, God, we thank you for this time to be in your house right now. We ask you to have your way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Now, if you have a question and you weren't prepared and you want to write it down and send it up here, uh, you can go ahead and feel free to do that. If you have a question and you want to get it up to me, we'll do our best to try to answer it. All right. So, but if not, we'll jump right into some of these that we already have. And with the help of the Lord, try to answer them. All right. So, we do know about Thursday service, right? Amen. Thursday service, 11 p.m. is our New Year's Eve service. And looking forward to having a time of worship, reflection, and preparing ourselves for the new year. Amen. Amen. Be able to make it join us Thursday, 11 p.m. All right. All right. So I'm going to go to probably the first question. We've had it in there for some time. Uh, and it's a question about um, how to address one another. Uh, it says, as a believer... We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. We are equal in the eyes of God. Uh, but can I or should I call my pastor or elder's brother? What is the proper address to the man of God? Um, and so it's a good question, one that we've, I think, had before. How do you address somebody? How do you address somebody? It kind of falls in a line of respect, uh, in respecting our elders um, we, we are pretty old-fashioned and very conservative in our beliefs, you know, as, as, uh, as Christians. And in our church, we believe that people should be given honor, to whom honor is due. That's what the Bible says. Um, we're not as liberal and as relaxed as you'll find in some other churches where people are, everyone's on a first-name basis and... You know, the pastor, the people call the pastor by the first name and maybe even a nickname or call him buddy and call him bro and call him dude man and call him whatever. bro dog or whatever, you know, whatever feels good. We don't do that um, because it's not appropriate. <laughs> it's not appropriate uh, to address uh, a man of God, a minister, a woman of God in that way. In that way. Now, um, there are, there are, there's a time and a place for everything. There's a time and a place for everything. Um, um, especially when it comes to your elders and people that are in authority. So, let's just, just go to the Bible. A couple verses from the Bible. Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 10. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. And just a couple verses just that talks about it. And this just doesn't apply to pastors. 
Um, but the Bible teaches us as we're going to read that there should be a mutual respect uh, between believers, one to another, one to another. And so Romans 12, uh, verse 10, I believe, is the verse we're going to, to, to pick up. We're going to pick up verse 9 also. Let love be without dissimulation, and abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. In honor preferring one another. There's something about brotherly love. The city called Philadelphia is the city of what they call brotherly love. From the word philos, or uh, in the Greek, it's, it speaks of brotherly love. And my mother happens to be from Philadelphia, that area. And so the Bible talks about having a brotherly love one towards another. Now, in Christ, when we get saved and become part of the family of God, when we're born again, we become part of one family. Although we have different fathers and mothers naturally in the earthly side of things, when we are saved, we are born again and brought into a greater family, that is the family of God. Therefore, we become brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Amen. And that's why the Bible speaks about having a brotherly love one towards another. A, a, a love that is genuine, a love that is, he said, without dissimulation. That word means without pretense. It's not fake. It's not dissimulation. It's not a simulation. Right? Amen. It's not a simulated love. You know, you're simulating it and you're pretending to love, but you're faking it. Amen. That's what he's talking about. And the only way that is accomplished is through, through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Because the fruit of the Spirit is love. Amen? Amen. Amen. Is love. And so that's also why we refer to each other as brother and sister, you know, because we're in the family of God. You know, I've had people ask me before, especially from... Uh, people that come from maybe different backgrounds, or they're not familiar with church, they're not familiar with, maybe you hear it more so maybe in the Baptist uh, circles, or Pentecostal circ circles, brothers and sisters, and you call this one brother so and so that, I've had people ask me, why do you say that? You know, because we're in the family of God, we're in the same family, that's really all that is, all right, and, and it doesn't mean you have to address somebody by brother first, and then their name, right? We're not, we don't, we don't make that rule. There's no rule, there's no law that everyone has to have a bro preceding their name, or a sister preceding their name. It's a thing of respect. Sometimes you do use it, sometimes you don't. It just kind of, we casually say things sometimes, and we may or may not use it, uh, but out of respect, you know, we, we do that. We honor one another. Right? We honor one another. And it says here to prefer one another. The true love of Christ that we read throughout the Bible is a preferring love. A preferring love. And that's the, the amazing thing about God's love, is that when it fills our hearts, we no longer, this, the, the life, no, life in the world no longer revolves around us. Right? When we become Christians, our focus and our love becomes not just self-centered, but it becomes Christ-centered, first of all, but then we begin looking outward, you know, and it's not about us anymore, because God, by the workings of Christ, removes that selfish spirit, that selfish Amen. desire, that, that says, me first, you know, get me first, me first, I want to be in the head of the line, I want to be the first one, I, I want to be, you know, this, that, and the other, that's fleshly, that's worldly, that should not be in the life of a Christian and a believer. It should be, not me, brother, you go first. You know, if there's only two hams or one ham left, uh, brother, you go, why don't you take it, right? I prefer you. That's called preference, preferring one another, right? If there's only one banana left on the shelf in there and two brothers get there at the same time, brotherly love is... You know, brother, you go ahead. You take it. I don't, I don't need it. I'm good to go. You know, you take the banana, right? That's preferring one another, right? Right? No, not even cutting it in half. Because you prefer your brother, right? You're, you're removing yourself from it. You're saying, no, you have it. I'm good to go. And sometimes it gets even more weird when they say, no, I prefer you. No, I prefer you. I prefer you back. And you go back and forth. And, you know, 
then someone else comes on and says, okay, I'll take it if you all want to argue about it. Right? So it's about respect. It's about respect. And if, if you have a hard time honoring somebody or preferring somebody uh, and, and, you know, just giving that preference, as the Bible tells us to esteem each other better than themselves, Amen. the Bible says. Amen? Amen. To esteem each other better than themselves. So, as a Christian, our mindset is, that's not just a brother, but, you know, he's better than me. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. Isn't that, isn't that wild tonight? Isn't that, far, wow. isn't that far out? Isn't that radical? Is that something you hear? Is that something you hear all the time? That we should have a mind that says, let me esteem this person better than me, right? He's right. worthy of more preference than me. He, he should go first, and he should have the, you know, whatever. That's the mind of Christ, because that's what Jesus did for us. Amen? Amen. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy 5. I don't want to give this too much time. 1 Timothy 5, verse 17 to 19. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 19. Now this has to do with the, the elders, preachers, pastors, etc. Um, 1 Timothy 5, verse 17. says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, <laughs> And the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So this is a duty that he says here to elders. Those that rule well should be counted worthy of not just honor. Now, God begins to put them in a different category. They're worthy of double honor. Double honor. Those that labor in the word, the doctrine, this brings in the ministry, teachers, preachers, elders of that nature. Those, those that do that, the Bible puts them, although we are equal, part of the question was we're equal in the eyes of God, but yet there is a, there is a, there is a structure and there is an order of how ranking and respect is to be given. He said you give double honor to those that labor in the word and doctrine. Spiritual leaders, men and women of God, people of God should be given a higher honor, right, than just another brother or sister. Amen. This is what the Bible Amen. teaches us, Amen. right? And he goes on even further. There's so much more in that, um, but it's a respectful thing to address somebody according to, you know, their title, to who they are, whether a reverend or a pastor or an evangelist. However, it's, it's a term of respect. That's what. It, that's really what it is. Now we don't. I don't demand that people call me pastor, and Reverend doesn't walk around saying, "You call me Reverend," you know. And, and he, you know, I don't. At home, I don't make my wife call me Reverend, and the kids call me. No, you call me Reverend Par. That's, I'm. I'm Reverend Par. I'm not your daddy Par. I'm your. Reverend. You know. You know. I don't demand that. We're not. We're not dumb, right? We don't have an ego. We don't. We don't walk around seeking that, right? And any pastor that would demand that, you call me pastor, you know, you know, is, it's a little bit weird. It's a little bit on the edge. It's a little bit on the borderline. Although it is right, although it is proper, right, there's some things that just, you know, you, you know, demand it. It's just, it's a teaching of the scripture. So sometimes I am a little bit, you know, taken aback by some of the things people call me. Right, and I don't mind, especially if you call me by my first name. Especially if you're older than me, my elder, I don't, I don't take offense at all to that. If you call me by my first name, but you know, whatever. Um, but sometimes, if there's other people around, it may be better to address the pastor as the pastor, not just for your sake, but just for other people that are around and looking. I don't know. That's how I feel when my pastor's around. I call him pastor and call him, you know, just out of respect and also as a testimony. Amen. That other people see. Amen. But again, not being weird about it, not being, but Amen. it's about respect. You honor men and women of God. People in authority, police officers, officers, you know, people that you may not know, Mr., Mrs., these, these old fashioned terms of respect are still proper and are still right in our day and age today, right? And especially children, 
you know, children, you know, we have, we know each other well here, but I remind my children sometimes, you should call that, you know, you shouldn't be calling that elder by their first name. You should say Mr. or Mrs., you know, right? right? Because that's a proper thing to do, and you don't want to lose that element of respect, right? right. You don't want to lose that element of respect, because yeah, I, putting that term, that, that title there, it, 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 it puts your mind in the right place, right? And it also causes you to remember who that person is, right? And remember your place. So, Amen. Giving honor to whom honor is due. There's another scripture, Matthew 10, verse 40. We don't have time to go to it. Matthew 10, 40. Jesus said, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. If you receive a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, uh, you receive a righteous man's reward. So even Christ talked about the level of respect we give will be... Uh, the type of reward we receive, Amen. right? And so, you want a pastor's reward, give a pastor's respect. If you want a righteous man's reward, give a righteous man's respect. He was saying that you, what you give is what you're going to get Amen. back. Right. And so, yeah. praise the Lord. And I have pastors that call me pastor. I'm like, you know, why are you calling me pastor? And I had a pastor one time call me pastor. And I said, you know, and he's older than me too. And I'm like, you know, you don't need to call me pastor. I'm Brother Parr to you. you know, I'm going to call you pastor. And he quoted this verse. He said, Pastor, I'm going to do this because that's what Jesus said, because I want a pastor's reward. <laughs> right? And that's where he shared it with me. And I thought, you know, that makes sense, doesn't it? That makes sense. So, anyway, let's go on from there. Let's go on from there. Do we have an accident? Okay. Is that water? Yeah. Is it water? Okay. Yeah, be careful. All right, this question is about the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day. It says, God rested on the seventh day, so why do we honor, why do we honor that day on the first day of the week? Why do we honor that day on the first day of the week? So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, it does tell us that God rested on the seventh day from all of his labor in creation, the beginning. And so, it records that God rested on the Sabbath day. This he did uh, as an example and as a law that he would establish even to his people, even in the Ten Commandments, it says to uh, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And so this God did to establish to man that man needed a day of rest. It wasn't that God needed to rest. God doesn't get tired. Amen. God doesn't get weary, right? The Bible says he never sleeps, he never slumbers, right? The Sabbath was not, uh, Sabbath, the Bible says in the, in the gospel, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Amen. And so when God established the Sabbath day of rest, he was giving this for two reasons. Number one, that man gets tired. Man is physical, man is human, man loses energy, he needs to regain that. There needs to be time for the man to rest, take time from his labor. But this was also that God was pointing, going, to, going to use this to show humanity that, like he did with many of the other things, that man was going to need another kind of rest, a spiritual rest. Not just a physical rest, but a spiritual rest in their hearts and in their souls. So like the sacrifices, the blood offerings, a lot of the types and foreshadows we find in the Old Testament were just uh, types and figures of what was going to come in Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior, right? The Sabbath is that way also. Let's look at a couple of verses. Uh, Mark, Mark 2, Mark 2. Mark chapter 2, Mark Twain. Mark Twain, wow. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. Mark 2, verse 23. All righty then. And it came to pass that as he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? This is, of course, their 
legalistic mindset because the Sabbath was supposed to be a day of rest, and here they were picking corn and eating corn. So in the Pharisees' mind, they're working. What are they doing? They shouldn't be doing that. What are they doing that on the Sabbath day? This is what they said, and, G and this is Jesus' response. Verse 25, had, and he said unto them, Have you never read what David did when he had need and was hungered, and they that were with him? How that he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat but for the priest, and gave also to them that were with him? And he said unto them that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And so there's a priority here. Man, right, was not made for the Sabbath, right? But the Sabbath was made for man. God established it for us. And then where Jesus himself said the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. What does that mean? What does Sabbath mean? Sabbath means a time of rest, right? It means to, to rest, to take time to rest. That's literally what a Sabbath is, right? A sabbatical that some people take uh, is a time of rest, an extended period of rest that uh, some, some preachers get in some denominations. They get a time of rest and they have a sabbatical, right? So man needed rest. And here we find in the New Testament that Jesus be, is the Lord of that rest. He is the Lord of that rest. He's the master of it. He's the ruler of it, right? Amen. And so they found fault with Christ not only here but other places when he performed miracles and he did certain things. He even told the parable of the lost sheep. He said, if you have sheep that is lost on the Sabbath day, don't you go out and find the sheep and deliver it and save it and bring it in? Because their mind and attitude towards the Sabbath was very legalistic. They took it to where... Nothing can be done on the Sabbath day. They even had in the law certain distances that they could travel on the Sabbath day, only a certain amount of miles. They couldn't go beyond that. It was very restrictive. It was very restrictive. There's a lot in the law that was very burdensome for the people, right? And so when they see Christ coming and doing all this, they thought he's, you know, blasphemy. He's breaking the law. Here he is doing things that he shouldn't be doing, but they didn't understand the true intent or the spirit of why there was rest established, right? And we believe that the rest was established in the law to show man that they needed a time of rest. This wasn't just about going to the temple on Saturday, the, se the seventh day of the week. This was deeper than that. Let's look at what it says. Let's look what it says in uh, Romans. Romans, please, Romans. No, Colossians first, then Romans. I'm sorry. Colossians first, then Romans. This go, these go together. These go together. Colossians. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. Let's read verse 14. Verse 14. Paul talks a lot about here the, the ceremonial law being abolished, right, in Christ. Christ came to fulfill the law and do away with certain things. Verse 14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now this is Paul, and he had a lot of people that he had to deal with that were the, some Jews that were saved, and then reaching out to the Gentiles who had no... Had no uh, really responsibility to the law, and no background with the law. And he says here what Christ did upon the cross, the ceremonial traditions, a lot of these things that people were doing that, as in Paul's, word, in Paul's words here, uh, how does it say? 
that was against us, these ordinances that were against us, they were contrary to us, because there was no way that man could keep all these things perfectly, right? We find that through the law. There was no way man could keep every single point, every single part of the law, and Paul later says that the law was a schoolmaster teaching us that they're outside of God's help, there's no way you're able to keep all of this law because he said if you keep it all and offend at one point, you're an offender, right? right? And so the law was so big and so burdensome, really, to teach people that there's no way you can satisfy all of the requirements and all of the needs without God's help, all right? right. And so Christ came because these things were impossible to, to do on a, man, on a man or woman by themselves. The laws, the offerings, all of these things were all pointing to the fact that there would be a more perfect sacrifice from a perfect Savior to give us better promises and a better hope. And all these things Amen. were being fulfilled when Christ Jesus came, when He died upon the cross, uh, and He rose again the third day, Amen. because that's when real rest was finally accomplished uh, for the souls of men and women. Amen. Amen. And so now in the New Testament, uh, uh, the laws against eating certain meats, the laws and requirements against doing certain ceremonies and all of these things, they were fulfilled in Christ. No longer were these things a requirement uh, for the believer in Christ in order to go to heaven, right? God came to fulfill these points. And so Paul says here, don't let anyone judge you in meat or drink or respect of a holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come, right? These are only a shadow, but what is, what is, what is it that we, what is more important? What is the point here? Do we, do we hold on to a shadow? You can't grasp a shadow, right? You can't hold on to a shadow. You don't really receive anything from a shadow. You may see it, but that's all it is. It's a, it's a shadow, a reflection of another body, that is greater, that the light is being shed on. And he says here, these are a shadow of things to come. The law, the offerings, the Sabbaths, these are only a shadow, right? But it's not the true image, and it's not the person of Christ. That's what Paul says. The body is of Christ. So it came to a point to where the Jews, they were still holding on to the shadow. They're still following the shadow of the law, and they're not grasping the life of Christ. Amen? Amen. And that's what Paul is trying to break down here. You don't follow the shadow anymore, but you should follow the one that's casting the shadow, and that's Jesus Christ. Yes. All right? And so, uh, and the main part of the question is, why do we observe it on the first day of the week? There's so much more in this. Um, Matthew 8, 28, uh, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you Sabbath, Amen. right? Amen. He said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus Christ is the one who has become our rest. The reason why we began observing, um, really not even the Sabbath day, but the day of the Lord, became known as the day of the Lord, why we worship on Sundays, is because what day did Jesus rise again from the dead? Very. Sunday. The first day of the week, right? What does the Bible say? The first day of the week. What is the first day of the week? Sunday. According to the Jewish calendar, and the Jewish uh, is is Sunday, the first day of the week. Saturday was their Sabbath day, their day of rest. According to the Jewish calendar, Sunday was the day that Christ rose again from the dead. This is the day that they came to the tomb early in the morning. It was that first, what we call Easter morning. And so that became a practice in the early church that on the first day of the week they began to celebrate and worship their risen Savior. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so they began gathering on that first day of the week. Uh, Jesus himself appears unto his disciples after he rose again on four separate occasions on the first day of the week when he appeared unto them and from what we can tell in church history and everything, it became a, a, a practice, a more of a tradition, really, that we began worshiping on Sunday. Because this was the day we celebrate the Lord's re resurrection from the dead, right? And so, again, 
uh, going back to, let's go put that in with Romans. I said, I said Romans earlier, Romans chapter uh, 14. Whether it's one day or another day, this is where uh, people have to, because we're not under the law, we're not under the, the law and the ceremonial aspects of the law anymore as New Testament believers, right? We're not under that law any longer, right? Now some Jews may still practice that, that who's, you know, who have not been saved or born again yet, and to them it, it's, you know, still valid, I guess you can say, but Christ uh, is our rest. Let's look at Romans 14 and 5, I think. 14 and 5, yes. Romans 14, 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. He that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us live to himself, and no man dies to himself. Whether we live, whether, whether we live, we live to the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. So what is Paul's point here? Uh, one man esteems one day holy. Someone else esteems every day holy, right? Mm -hmm. He said, you be persuaded in your own mind. As you do it, you're doing it as unto the Lord, right? right? And so he says, if you do, if you think one day is more holy than the other, he said, that's, that's your persuasion. He says, let everyone be persuaded in their own mind. Mm -hmm. And so, obviously with the Jews, there were a lot of Jews that got saved that were still sensitive, having grown up all their life, that... The Sabbath day is still important, it's still a holy day, and there may have been people, more than likely, in those times that they, they still went to the temple, they still had temple readings, they still went on Sabbath day, on Saturdays to uh, partake of the law and certain things, but beyond that, there was something else beginning to happen. As believers were getting saved and people were gathering, they weren't just gathering in the temple, they started gathering in houses, they started gathering... Amen. Every day, the Bible says, daily the Lord was adding to the church. Amen. And every day, people were being added. Why? Because they just, they just felt that, hey, Jesus is such a big deal that he gets every day. Amen. 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 And so they did, as, you know, they did still practice certain things on the Sabbath day because there were still Jews, the, the people that still followed parts of the law. But it became a, a practice that on the first day of the week, which we know to be, you know, S Sunday, um, according to the Jewish calendar. Now, most of our first day of the week uh, in America now is Monday, right? <laughs> we consider it Monday. Monday is the first day, right? Friday is the payday. So, the, and there's a lot more scripture in this that talks about it. But the main point, I believe, is that Christ would become our rest. So, do we have a day then? There's some that still teach and preach that Saturday is the Sabbath day, and that's the only day. And if you don't worship on the seventh day, the seventh day Adventist, if you don't worship on that day, then you're, you know, you're somehow unholy or unqualified. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. It's not what the scriptures teach us. For Christ fulfilled the law um, in giving us rest. Man, the Sabbath was not made uh, for man. Man was, man was made, he said, for the Sabbath. Do I have any time here? It's already 8.02. Yes. Go ahead. On the Sabbath? Yes. Go ahead. Didn't the United States used to call, the, call this law the blue law? So I remember when I was stationed down in Virginia, all the malls, all the stores would be closed on Sundays. It, it used to be. I don't know if it was called the blue law, but it used you know to be. What they called it in Virginia. Um, the blue law. I'm, I'm not that old. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, this was actually in 1988. Yeah, right. I remember. Well, even, even in my early days uh, in other parts of the country, there was certain there were still remnants of 
a respect. America used yeah. to have a greater respect, yeah. right? Yeah. To yeah. your point, that's what you're talking about. America used to have a greater respect for Sunday being a day of the Lord, a day of rest, right. a day of yeah. the family, right? Yeah. Things were closed. They didn't sell alcohol even yeah. on some no, places. No on Sunday, right? Yeah. Nothing Dry no, counties. Right. When we were in Louisiana, there was a county down there uh, at our church where they didn't sell alcohol on Sunday. And some of them maybe didn't sell it until 11 o'clock, right? I don't know what that was about. I guess you go to church first and then go get drunk. I don't know. What <laughs> but there are remnants, right? And we don't do that anyway as Christians. We don't drink. We don't get drunk, Amen. right? We don't, Amen. We're saved. We're filled with the Holy Spirit, not other spirits. Amen? Amen. 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 Right. So that's what the Bible tells us. So there used to be a greater respect because this country was founded on Christian principles. Yeah. Christian ideology, right? Christian doctrine. And they came here from England with that in mind. We want to establish a Christian nation. So most of the laws we have, most of the, the traditions we have are rooted and grounded from the Word of God. And so, you know, we wish that would come back, but, you know, having a day where businesses were closed. Very few businesses are closed nowadays on Sunday. Very few. Very few businesses are closed on Sunday, right? Why? Because they want that money. Right. Yeah. They want that money. They want that money. Very few yeah. factories are closed. Why? Because they want that money, you know? But if they would just honor the Lord, God would make up for it. Amen. And there's some examples of businesses that do that. How many know Chick-fil-A? Yeah. Chick-fil-A. They are closed on Sunday. I was just they are never open on Sunday because the owner is a Christian. The owner is a believer. Well, and they know. made that determination a long time ago. We are not going to open on Sunday because they want to honor the Lord, right? Amen. Amen. So all the workers, all the people are off on Sunday. And guess what? They're one of the most successful fast food restaurants. I don't know what number. Number two. Number two after McDonald's, right? Yeah. In sales and production. And they're closed one day of the week, right? Right. God does that, right? Amen. Amen. God does that. There's a couple car dealerships even around Columbus. Yeah. Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Honda, I think, yeah. is one of them. Closed on Sundays because it's the right thing to do. You all heard their ad before, right? Yeah. yeah. Right? There used to be a lot greater influence of that because that goes to the Christian belief and understanding that there should be a day given to the Lord, right? Now, Sunday, you know, should be time anyway. Yeah. Right? Again, we're not under the law, per se, right? But we do want to honor the Lord, right? Amen. And take time Amen. to honor the Lord. Amen. And I do believe that, too. We, it needs to be a day. And Sunday, in my mind, in my persuasion, Amen. ever since we were, my parents tried to raise me that way, um, I didn't always follow it, but once I got saved, I followed it. Amen. Right? I'm going to church on Sunday, Amen. no matter what's Amen. going on, right? I don't miss church. I don't put work or anything else in front of church because it's Amen. important, right? Amen. It's important. If I'm not here and I'm traveling or somewhere else on Sunday, wherever I'm at, I'm going to church. That's right. right? Wherever I'm at, I'm going to go to church. Why? Because I don't believe that uh, we should miss church. Amen. Right? Amen. I believe it's my conviction in honoring the Amen. Lord. So uh, people that don't want to believe that, that's their choice. They have to be persuaded in their own mind. But you know what? As you honor the Lord... Uh, it comes back again. Amen. It comes back again. So we're out of time. They're going to close. One last thing. Yeah. With Chick Fil A, we actually put it in the contract when they go like in, in the malls and different places like that. They actually put it in the contract. They will be closed every Sunday. Okay. I knew I knew a mall in New Jersey. That's the only day that every other restaurant in the mall made money was on Sunday because Chick-fil-A made all the money for the rest of the week. I used to be a manager at Chick-fil-A. When, when you stand for God, God stands for you, right? Amen. Amen. It's about honoring the Lord, yeah. right? Some people don't have the faith to step out, you know, and to honor the Lord and give God what's right, you know, and people have to be persuaded. People have to be I have to come to that realization. Um, but good questions. We don't, you know, there's a couple more about 
walking by faith and some about the soul and the spirit and maybe in the first Tuesday of the year we'll get some more. Now if you have more, please write them down. If you have more questions, write them down. Put them in the box, all right? Put them in the box. Um, we want to start, we want to end this year and start the year, amen, just worshiping the Lord, appreciating all that He's done for us, amen? Amen. amen. Let's stand as we prepare to dismiss tonight, as we pray. Let's give God the glory. Amen. Yes. Let's give God the glory. Father, tonight we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, God, for your word this evening. God, we thank you for the reality in serving you. And when we honor you and when we put you first, and when we do what is right, God, you're able. You're able, Lord, to just turn things around, God, to your glory. And God, we just thank you tonight for this time to be in your house. We ask your blessing upon your people. Minister, move by your spirit in our lives, God, as we go forward for you. God, we thank you for this Bible study. We thank you for your great faithfulness throughout this year, God. And we can be standing here in your house tonight, God, honoring you and giving you glory. Not just tonight, but all the time, Lord. We just ask you to help and move in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. Remember, brothers and sisters, the, the different prayer requests, different people, Joycelyn, her father passing away. Remember, we keep praying for Antoine, Carmen's grandson, um, Kamalu's mother, who had a stroke. And we also want to add to the list uh, Sister Kia's uncle. Her uncle is in the hospital. They found a tumor on his brain, and he's, he's in, he needs help, he needs healing. And so please be in prayer for uh, Uncle Gene. Uncle Gene's his name, okay? Be in prayer for, for him. And all these I had listed on the on the screen too. Hopefully you saw them. Um, and some other people. So and Donna, remember Donna as well. Donna passing over mom. So pray for one another. We're coming to an end of this year, and there's a lot, a lot happening, a lot going on. Walk softly. Amen. Walk softly. Walk humbly before your God. Amen. Amen. Walk humbly before your God. Amen. Amen. All right. You go with God. God go with you. Amen. Go with you.